Good evening. It's wonderful to see all of you here. Uh, my name is Catherine Nemeth Tuttle, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this panel entitled Celebrating 50 Years of the February Sisters. And as you are likely aware, this panel is the first of a series of four panels commemorating the 50th anniversary of the February Sisters, a group of 30 women and four children who occupied KU's East Asian Studies building on February 4th, 1972, demanding that the administration of the University of Campus implement, of Kansas implement a variety of measures to increase gender equity on campus. The February Sisters' demands included an affirmative action program, which was federally mandated, a daycare center, scholarship equity, a woman to fill the vacant vice chancellor of academic affairs position, the end of unfair employment practices, a women's studies department, and a women's health program, including birth control access. And as Robin Morgan was conversing before we started, these are very reasonable demands uh, then and now. Two days before, on February 2nd, Robin Morgan spoke to over 350 people in the ballroom right outside our room today. Her words inspired the February sisters to action. They pre prevailed and the University of Kansas was transformed. These four panels explore the events of February 1972, the progress that has been made in those intervening 50 years, and the state of politics and activism at KU in Kansas more broadly and in the area. We had originally planned for this celebration to be in February, which would have been the exact 50 year mark, but many of us were holed up in our homes uh, <laughs> looking at Zoom or uh, putting our masks on and we thought this might be, uh, and I'm glad we waited because it's giving us a better chance to be here together and we're delighted to see you. Before I introduce our panel, I would like to acknowledge our generous sponsors and partners, the Emily Taylor Center for Women and Gender Equity and the, uh, the table in the back of the room ha happens to have a, a whole piece on Emily Taylor and her legacy here. The Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies that is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, the Hall Center for the Humanities, and the Watkins Museum of History. We hope that you will join us for the remaining panels in this series which take place um, uh, this week at April 7th at the Lawrence Public Library. We're really having a very interesting politics discussion with Kathleen Sebelia, Sandy Prager, uh, Barbara Ballard, uh, a video with um, Sharice Davis. I think it'll be an exciting evening. Uh, we have uh, the flyers that tell, and those are also at the back. So please pick one up. And then next week, on um, April 12th and 14th, we'll be right back here in the Centennial Room at 6:30. More information is available on the websites of the Emily, Emily Taylor Center, the Women's Studies Department, the Watkins Museum of History, and on Facebook. This program is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the WGSS website. Uh, thank you. I want to make a special thank you to Professor Nick Surrett, who's at the very back of the room, to Kathy Rose Mockery, and I believe she's not here this evening, and to Megan Williams. They were part of our uh, crew that tried to put this together, and among others, and uh, I thank them for their help. You may have heard the carillon on your way in. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Berghar, who is the University Carillionist, Co uh, was uh, playing for us tonight. She was doing sister songs, and so some of you might have heard of some beautiful music. I want to add that you'll see some, a bowl of apples on the back table. Our flyer features a unique design of a fist within an apple that was created by Megan Williams. <laughs> And some of you know what that means, but uh, and Megan's the Assistant Director of the Emily Taylor Center. This speaks to the power and compassion of the February sisters who left an apple on each of the professor's desks when they left the East Asian Languages building. So feel free to enjoy one and take it with you when you leave. Uh, before we begin, I want to say that tonight's program is done in remembrance of three February sisters who have passed on but will be forever remembered. Carol Jean, C.J. Brune, and I want to recognize her husband and son who are here with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Mary Coral and Joan Driscoll. I do have more information both about C.J. and Mary for any of you that are interested and can give you that handout. Now let me introduce the panel and you'll notice that I'm 
Uh, I'm actually going to read the entire introductions for some of these folks because I think they give a history of women's activism in Lawrence, and I think it's important for us to know that. So bear with me, but they're, uh, I think they're really meaningful. Christine Leonard smith Christine has been an activist since 1963 and is still active today. She has worked for voting rights, racial integration in Lawrence, and an end to the Vietnam War, and several wars since. Women's equality, fair label practices, and children's rights, but always her main goal was and is peace. Through the years, Christine worked with or, and or belonged to the Congress of Racial Equality, Student Peace Union, Students for Democratic Society, Civil Rights Commission, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and the February Sisters. Currently, she works with the Lawrence Coalition for Justice and Peace and Justice. To pay the rent, Christine worked in libraries, a very honorable profession. <laughs> we have a few librarians here tonight. And for, li and, and for library automation companies as a library assistant, an automation customer liaison, and finally technical writer, which was her absolute favorite job. She's now retired and edits the Lawrence Progressive Calendar, and I'm sure if you ask her, she can put you on the mailing list. Elizabeth Schultz. After finishing her PhD at the University of Kansas, it, I'm sorry, University of Michigan. <laughs> at, yes, University of Michigan in 1967, Beth joined the English department at the University of Kansas, retiring in 2001. Soon after arriving, she began to develop courses in African American literature, which she continued to teach until her retirement. She also developed courses in the short story soon after her arrival. Increasingly, Beth became more dedicated to teaching American literature from a feminist perspective. She introduced courses through the English Department for the Study of Women in the History of English and American Literature. During her tenure in the English Department, she also became the chair of the Humanities Program and under its aegis developed a number of interdisciplinary courses in the Humanities Program. Her scholarship, however, focused primarily on African American, American literature, and women's literature. Beth is best known internationally for her writings on Herman Melville, especially with regard to Melville and the arts. Beth is glad to say that she continues to be in touch with many of her former students who continue to teach her. Jeanette Alexander, over here. Jeanette worked as a librarian at KU for over four decades. She was operations manager for the SPAR Engineering Library and had a passion for helping KU students. And I was able to find a great article about her, which I thought was very apropos uh, because it deals with KU basketball. <laughs> her, her, uh, her former student, a great basketball player named Tony Guy. Does that name ring a bell for some of you folks? Well, uh, Jeanette was very inspirational, it is very important to him. Uh, he would, she inspired him to come to the library and had a long-term impact on his life. Uh, he brought the whole basketball team to the library so she could help them learn, help them about learning research techniques. So I think that's a wonderful story she had. In the same way that she, in the same way she supported the February sisters, including including being on the food committee, which was very important, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, Jolene Anderson. And this is the one where I wanted to give you a little short history of activism in Lawrence. During the 1960s and 70s, Joe participated in numerous civil rights and anti-war rallies and marches. In the spring of 1970, she co-founded the Food Conspiracy. Anybody remember that one? A loose, loose knit group of people who brought, this may sound very conspiratorial, but at the time it was, who bought produce and dairy products directly from farmers and sold them out of a basement storeroom. Sound, yeah, all right. Eventually, the food conspiracy became the community mercantile, where probably many of you shop today, now simply the Merc. In the 1980s, she became interested in local issues. She led a town hall meeting between physicians and those who wanted options for natural childbirth that eventually led to a birthing room in the Lawrence Memorial Hospital. And those of you who were giving birth in those years know what a difficult challenge it was to have humane practices around birth. Irving. Her home became a shelter for abused women before the Women's Transitional Care Center opened. She was a founding mentor, member of Tenants to Homeowners, an organization that provides home ownership for low-income families. In 1993, she won a four-year term on the Lawrence City Commission and served as mayor for one of those years. Did you know we had a mayor here on our panel? <laughs> uh, in 1993, she, uh, see, Wait a minute. Her most important accomplishment was the passage of the Simply Equal Amendment 
that added sexual orientation to the list of protected categories in the city's human right ordinance. And we were the first in Kansas, is that right, Joe? Oh yeah. yeah oh yeah, by a long way. In 2017, she participated in the Women's March in Washington, D.C. The next year, she and Christine Smith organized the Women's March in Lawrence, attended by 2,500 marchers. Her proudest moment in a protest was when she was arrested for singing too loudly and too long in Chris Kobach's office in 2018. Her arrest picture appeared on the front page of the Lawrence Journal World the very next day. So, currently, she's a member of the Decriminalization and Poverty Work Group in Douglas County. And from her shared experiences with people over the country, she is hoping to help make changes in the judicial systems locally to help stop the unjust persecution of poor people in Douglas County. Stay tuned. So I thought that would be good for seeing that range of political activity. And now, Jolene, if you could get your microphone on, I'm going to have you introduce our very special panelists today, Robin Morgan, coming to us from New York City. Is it on? Yes. Okay, great. An award-winning poet, novelist, political theorist, feminist activist, journalist, editor, and best-selling author Robin Morgan is here with us tonight. She has published 23 books, including the now classic anthologies, Sisterhood is Powerful, Sisterhood is Global, and Sister Sisterhood is Forever. She has been invited speaker at every major university in North America. She's traveled to most of the world's nations as organizer, lecturers, lecturer, and journalist. Uh, she spent, I think, I kind of like this part. She spent several months in Palestinian refugee camps reporting on the condition of women there. Her novels, nonfiction works, and poetry collections have been translated into 23 different languages. Her latest novel, Parallax, and poetry collection, Dark Matter, are now available, if anybody's <laughs> interested. She is currently the writer and host of the weekly podcast, Women's Media Center Live with Robin Morgan, and it's really good. You ought to tune in. Okay, as you can see, unlike a whole lot of us here, she's not ready for retirement. <laughs> now, when Robin Morgan came to KU February 2nd, 1972, no one knew quite what to expect especially the staff at the Kansas Union. They put us in the ballroom, which has all these partitions so you can make it as small or as big as you wanted. The first people who came arrived in a relatively small section that would host about 50 people. As more of us came, they had to keep removing the partitions until finally the room was at full capacity. In my memory, there were about 300 people there. What struck me was the silence. No one was talking as we came in, except in hushed whispers. It was like we were going to a sacred ceremony or a church service. The audience was mainly women with a fair number of feminist men as well. Yeah. After all, this is Lawrence. <laughs> Her lecture drew my full attention as well as everyone in the room. It was electrifying. When it ended, we wanted more. Several women stayed. Since my nearly three-year-old was with me, can you believe I have a 53-year-old <laughs> daughter? Jeez. Anyway, I took her home, but I took Robin Morgan's words with me, and they have stayed with me the rest of my life. <clears throat> and here's what I took from what she said. When you see something wrong, don't just try to adapt and go with the flow. Fix it instead. 
It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce my mentor and muse who lit the fire that inspired us all that night, Robin Morgan. Welcome to Lauren. <laughs> well, I think with that introduction, we must have Robin say a few words before I start asking questions of the panelists. I, and, and Robin, I wanted you to maybe reflect back on that night and think a little bit about, about your impressions of February 2nd, 1972. Well, you know, first of all, the February sisters have always stayed in my memory uh, and, and my heart. Uh, because it was absolutely unique. I was doing uh, a lot of speeches at that point because Sisterhood is Powerful had just come out uh, a year or so earlier and I was all over the country um, because the point of Sisterhood is Powerful was to not schlep to a college or a, 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 a gathering of women with shopping bags of mimeographed papers but instead to have I kept thinking, why don't we have one cheap, available, sort of pocket size, although it was thicker, um, compendium of the kinds of things that women are writing as they begin to have these clicks uh, of connecting the dots and thinking, oh, all is not well. Um, and for Dan's book was coming out, but it was very white and middle class and suburban and homemaker. It didn't appeal to younger women. It didn't appeal to women of color. It didn't, you know, I mean, it didn't cast a wide net. So I, because my background was in writing and in publishing, decided to use those skills and I put together this little red and white book called Sisterhood is Powerful. Uh, and it took off like many rockets. But the strange thing about the February Sisters was that um, of all the places I had been and the reason that it lives in my memory so keenly all these years uh, is that you, you, you did something. You did something really big. Um, and I came, uh, I was furious because I, you know, none of the basic things that we deserved and we needed, uh, we had. We didn't have them. We didn't have women's studies. We didn't have affirmative action. You know, she read the list. Uh, we didn't even have a gynecologist on campus who could uh, equip women with access to uh, uh, reproductive rights, with, to birth control. We didn't have these, we didn't have child care. Um, so, and we certainly didn't have women's studies. And so, when, you know, the most basic thing that can happen to a woman is to be taken seriously. And you took me seriously. <laughs> so, in I flew on my little broom. Uh, and uh, and I, you know, just exploded on stage and said, this is so wrong, this is not fair, this is not right, how can they do it? Uh, and then you did this within two days. I was very flattered after this because, of course, you have to understand that the Attorney General of Kansas uh, charged me with uh, crossing state lines to incite a riot. Laura <laughs> Miller, I'm sure. I was not permitted to come back to Kansas for at least five years. <laughs> I thought to myself, ha as if you could stop me. Uh, but at the 25th anniversary of the February Sisters, you did it again, you had an anniversary, and you brought me back. And I remember that one. I remember walking out onto the stage, and the first words I uttered were simply, Sisters, I have not mellowed. <laughs> uh, so there I was again on my little broom. Not so little, this broom. Uh, but I was so impressed and so moved by the different tone of this demonstration. Because colleges were going up all over the country. Columbia had gone up and uh, Kent State had gone, you know what I mean? They were, they were popping with students. Um, demanding their rights and different things. and But this was markedly different. And it set the tone, really did, for what would be years of demonstrations uh, at, at universities and colleges thereafter. The tone was um, reasonable. Uh, the demands really were eminently sensible. Uh, of course, they were considered, oh, my dear, shocking in the day, sort of, you know, like rattling their pearls. 
uh, uh, how go women's studies? Oh my God! And to want a vice chancellor to be a woman's post. <laughs> But they were, most of them, achieved. Um, the ones that weren't, people went back very calmly and demanded again. The tone and the tenor of the demonstration was different. It wasn't trying to get off being a big male hero. It wasn't strutting around. It wasn't uh, a lot of four-letter words. It wasn't revolution, all those words ending in T-I-O-N and, and I-S-M that are very boring. It was very grounded, very real, and it had tremendous wit. It was very funny, it was practical. There were food groups. I don't mean groups of food, I mean groups of women organizing food and getting food in. There were there was the child care people, some of whom are here tonight. There there were the people who were inside and who had trained themselves and each other in what to do if there was an arrest in how to handle that. There were lawyers standing by. There were, uh, I mean, it was amazing. It was so bloody efficient. It was efficient. Uh, it was like feminist work is never done on top of women's work is never done because this was thoughtful. It had been thought through. It had been intelligently done and it was intelligently executed. And I, to this day, am just so grateful uh, I've written about you, February Sisters, many times. You know, since Sister Sisterhood is Powerful, there have been 23 other books, even though to this day most people come up and say, oh, Sisterhood is Powerful. <laughs> but that's fine. That's all right. Um, uh, and, but it, the, 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 it isn't the memory. It's the contemporary living of it. Still enraging because some of those things we still don't have still infuriating because there's a whole menu of other things that we desperately need uh, and that, we're, that we demand. I was thinking just the other day of, um, of the name of women, is it women, gender studies and sexuality, something like that, women, right? Women, gender and sexuality studies. Gender and sexuality studies. And how that with all respect in the world for its importance and for the way it had to be fought for and for the way it had to be won. Uh, and we've got it and we keep it. But there is another way, another aspect to that as a feminist that gives me pause. Uh, it also gives me ears and a tail on the top of pause. Uh, but it, it, it gives me pause because we fought so hard for so long not to be instantly associated with sexuality. Women, sex, sex, women. Um, and w one of the basic things we kept trying to do was to say, hello, we have brains, brains here functioning. Uh, uh, talent, uh, we're artists, we're scientists, we're, we're lots of different things. Hello, we're not just bedmates, we're not just wives, we're not. Um, because you have to remember that back then, I couldn't get a driver's license in my own name, it had to be my husband's name. I couldn't get a loan in my own name, it had to be joint loan. Rape in marriage did, was a concept that did not exist. Sexual harassment was a concept that did not exist. Kitty McKinnon had to invent the phrase, uh, and so forth and so on. So we're talking about a landscape that's very, very, very different. But I think that even, even today, getting away with having Women's studies right out there, or feminist studies. Even. Oh, ooh, think of that. Um, talk about radical. Is uh, is to me preferable because it doesn't reassociate us with only one aspect of our femaleness. That's a small quibble, however. Um, what you did and what you do by continuing, you know, to to keep on that struggle and assimilate new issues as you go. I mean, I was listening to those biographies and I, that's when I started to, you know, tear up because what amazing women, what amazing women you are. And if I could just hold a mirror up to you so you could see how beautiful you are and so that your students and the younger women who you work with can carry themselves with the pride that they deserve because they stand on your shoulders, I would be very happy with them.
So that said, I've rambled on enough. And Thank I you so much, start. Robin. You, you really set the table for us here so that we can uh, move forward. So thank you for that. And, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I think I'll, I'll turn to the panelists now, and I've kind of a combined question to uh, perhaps reflect on, on your memories of, of Robin's talk. I know you met with her, some of you, prior to the talk, so she knew about the issues, uh, but also just explain to the audience your connection and your role with the February Sisters, and then we'll move on to talk a little bit more about the actual op occupation and, and, and the demands. So, Christine, would you like to start just talk about your connections to this uh, my name is christine smith it was christine leonard at the time i was in the house with my two children uh, my son christopher called toffer who is six and my daughter who is two um, <laughs> several years later three or four four or five i don't know my son said to me one night, do you remember the night we stole that house? <laughs> um, I, I was at a potluck that we had before Robin, for Robin, before the, the uh, my, Minority Opinions Forum, which is the uh, organization that sponsored her on campus. Uh, and we, at that, at that potluck, uh, Robin did what great organizers everywhere have done throughout time. She said, what's going on? <laughs> uh, and we began to tell what we were all working on, the various women at the, the um, potluck. And we found that there were two groups of women trying to get daycare on campus. There were three groups of women working on decent health care for women. Uh, there were women working on uh, a women's studies program and they were laughed at by the university. So those of us who, who were at the potluck first were already mad. We hadn't heard the speech yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but, but we were enthralled by it, as, as Joe pointed out. We loved it. Um, and then I, I went home. When, when they threw us out of the union, after that, uh, I took my children and went home. And that was Wednesday night. At midnight was when they threw us out of the union. Um, at Friday afternoon, I got a telephone call and said, if you want to be in on this action, be prepared to be gone for a week. You can bring your children or we'll find a babysitter for them. Um, and that was all, that was all I knew. And I went and waited with my children and a lot of luggage, a two-year-old, these diapers. And, I mean, uh, it wasn't just <laughs> uh, some hippie picking up her stuff. Uh, and, uh, and, and went into the house. And um, it was an incredible experience. The women were wonderful. Um, the, the energy was just fantastic. Um, and I ended up being on the second negotiating team that met with uh, Cinex. And it was, uh, I, I just said, it, it wasn't enlightening so much as it was in darkening um, that this is what the seats of power of a major university look like. It was pretty sad and I was pretty disappointed in it. Uh, but, but we did get a lot accomplished. We felt really good. We felt like we had, had done it right and that real change would come and sure enough it did. Um, and so that's what I did <laughs> during, during the revolution. And Christine, this was a bitterly cold night, right? And you were, and you, so when you talked about these negotiations, you were going up in the middle of the night to Strong Hall, is that right? Yes, it was six degrees that night. And the house was an old Victorian house on Louisiana Street that the had East like, Asian. huh? The, East East, Center for East Asian the Center for East Asian Studies. Um, it had a basement and then the first floor and then you walked up to the sidewalk. So, so there were like two stories kind of underground, so to speak. And then there were 
two or three stories on top of that. And to get out of the building, we needed to go up and out a, a, a window on the top floor onto the fire escape because all of the doors were chained and locked. There were, there was, we weren't messing around here. Um, and, and, <laughs> and it was a rickety, <laughs> awful <laughs> uh, fire escape and it was freezing cold and it was windy and, was and dark and, <laughs> Yeah, there was no, it was, uh, it was very typically February. Uh, and so, yes, when we were running around in the night trying to meet with Cinex, we had to go through uh, the cold. And, you, and everywhere you went, you had to put on gloves and scarves and hats and coats. And, and then when you got there, you had to take them all off. <laughs> uh, so that's really part of the memory that I have. <laughs> Why don't we pass them or have have Joe talk a little bit about it. You were, the, uh, you're, you, what, how we listed you as official babysitter, which is quite an interesting title for a, a, a revolutionary action, but go right ahead. Okay. Um, there's a little red dot on this one. This one is just, this one's easier. Yeah, I am, I am technologically challenged. Um, so, I, I remember getting a call in the middle of the night. I'm thinking maybe Molly Cooley must have called me after you guys were kicked out of the union. And she said, we're planning an event uh, and kind of described it to me. We're going to try to, you know, do this uh, sit in or whatever. And we might get arrested. And a lot of us are mothers. So would you be willing to take care of up to 20 children <laughs> for up to 10 days? <laughs> and it was about, in my memory, it was about 2 a.m. And I was 25, so that wasn't too unusual to get a call at 2 a.m. Um, <laughs> And at the time, I was a preschool teacher, so without any hesitation at all, I said, oh, sure, easy bet. <laughs> oh, and I spent the next day organizing, and it wasn't hard. I mean, when I explained to people what was going on, it wasn't just, oh, sure, I'll do it. It was, oh, yeah, let me call my two friends and we can we had it organized. It was ready. We were, we were there. So I started getting children about 5 o'clock February 4th. I had a total of five. <laughs> well, the baby in the middle of the night. Oh, yes. A baby came in the middle of the night. Now, I was primed and ready for 20 children in 10 days. And they start, oh, the baby came, and then some guy went, came to get the, his father. <laughs> his father. <laughs> and by, oh gosh, early, early in the morning, the parents were coming to get the children. So my memory of the February sisters was kind of disappointed. <laughs> She didn't get to do everything. Now, what, would you pass the mic to Beth or Shanette? Well, let's do it. To, I'd like to go to Beth if we could just for a second. One thing I want to mention about um, Christine's role, which I think has been very neglected in our university, is she was a staff person. You know, she wasn't faculty. Uh, she was staff. And they were under the, K, uh, under the state of Kansas classified system. The pay scales were horrible. There had been a hiring and wage freeze. So I, I think when we think about the February sisters, there might be um, uh, an image, but I think it's very important to think about these women were working, uh, some, and some of them were students, some of them were faculty like Beth, but it was a range of women who, who made the university run. When you think about the support yeah. staff, they make this university run in a lot of ways. So I just wanted to mention that. Now Beth, you were a faculty member. You were actually one of the faculty mentioned on the demands list as, as one on the committee. 
And I, I think you, I recall that you said you brought food. Do you mm -hmm. wanna just talk a little bit about your role as a faculty member involved with the February Sisters? I don't know who it was, but um, probably about 8.30 at night, somebody knocked on my door. I lived in the old Santee Apartments, which is not far away from where the, uh, uh, the uh, building was that the February Sisters um, were occupying. But somebody came knocking on my door and said that women were occupying this building and they needed food. And could I help? So I had just finished dinner and I took whatever leftovers I had. I had just made a batch of cookies. I packed up that bag of cookies. I called a friend and we set off. Um, it was bitter, bitter cold that night. It really, really was. And there was a good deal of snow as, as uh, has been described already. But I set off um, to see if I could provide any, any food uh, or any other kind of help. I arrived at the house, and what I remember were children running up and down the hallway, <laughs> <laughs> having, having a fine old time. They had definitely taken over that. <laughs> but um, they were also interested in having some food, which I I and I think uh, I was with a couple of other women. We were able to provide, and then uh, we went home. But it was, I just will uh, once again describe the circumstances. It was a bitter cold night, and no one uh, on the faculty or the administration early on was prepared. So this happened quite unexpectedly. Um, later on, I mean, the February sisters made history. There's no question about it. And the next day, um, which others can describe, uh, things uh, broke loose uh, and there was a great deal of discussion. But that night, it was a kind of magical night because we were doing something that just had never been done before. And students were taking charge of the university, and that was extraordinary. Thank you, Beth. Would you like to pass down to, to Jeanette? And Jeanette, I think we're, we're on the kind of conversation of food, but I think that's one of the roles you played, right? You helped with the food, food committee? I did. I never actually occupied um, the Center for East Asian Studies, but <clears throat> I was called, and I didn't question why, but they told me to go to um, the building that later housed Hilltop and also uh, the Women's Center, which I ran um, on the second floor. And basically that, that was, was a the library. Wesley building, the Wesley Building across okay, from the Union. Thanks. Um, it's been in so many stages. Right, it has. <laughs> yes. um, I walked into it and um, there must have been 50 women busily preparing all kinds of foods from salads to jello to lasagna. And I just jumped in and started baking food. And we thought that this situation was going to take a long time. Like, I don't think it was, we thought 13 days, we thought longer. <laughs> So we decided that when the food was ready, I, we had to contact one of the people inside the building to take the padlock off and be able to move the food in on the second story. And you used your cell phone, right? <laughs> no cell phones. Um, <clears throat> we really did think that this would take forever. I mean, what was a doctor not a gynecologist, not allowing married women to have birth control. Or unmarried. Or unmarried, yeah. right. And um, so anyway, we thought that was just one demand. But um, of the five demands, or six demands, we got five. And um, <clears throat> So anyway, we arranged to deliver the food, which we did. And 
at the end of the night, we had to take it <laughs> elsewhere <laughs> or other uh, people were in hunger and um, they appreciated the food a lot. And all of us really felt that we were part of this. I mean, not only were we demanding certain food or uh, actions, um, but all of us were in it forever. I mean, it was definitely um, a very, um, how should I say this? The women were all united. They all believed in the same thing. We came from different places. Um, I came from the country uh, near Eudora on an abandoned dairy farm. But despite what all of us did, whether it was teaching or it was um, other demands that we have, and which have not all been met, there are still a lot of demands that we need to um, pull together. And um, there's one firm in Lawrence called Justice for All. Do any of you know that firm? It has representatives from every church. And they are pulling together some demands that have not been met including equality for blacks. Um, we were also very involved in that. And um, we went to Resurrection City. I don't know if you remember that in DC on the mall. And um, those demands are still wanted today in Justice for All. Um, it's not the same because we didn't have it have a unifier like we did with Robin Morgan. So um, it didn't pull together with all the women, and there must have been a hundred women involved in one small shape or form, and um, we. Um, we decided very early, I don't know if it was one person's decision, but it was not to give names out. Yeah. And yeah. That was, we you didn't want, want, you want to talk about that, Christine, a little bit about I being remaining about yeah. anonymous. Yeah. yeah. If you want to go pass the mic down to uh, Christine and also kind of, we talked about the, talk, you thinking it was going to be two weeks worth of food and stay, but the next morning, <laughs> the next morning, the Why? demands, the, <laughs> demands had been, some of them had been substantially met, and you walked out of the building and several dozen women were there to uh, blend in with you. So when the women left the building, that anonymity could be retained. So talk a little bit about that, and then how did the demands get so, how did that process get resolved so quickly? Uh, okay, uh, we, we decided to only use first names. It was assumed that one, at least one of the persons in the house was a spy of some sort. It was general paranoia, and it wasn't totally uh, imaginary. <laughs> um, but if that person existed, I don't know who they were. <laughs> so we only used first names. And um, it, it, most of the, the women in the house were students. There were, uh, there was uh, one high school student, uh, a, a professor's daughter, I think, Foyer, Norm Foyer? Yep. Um, his daughter was, was in the house. There was a faculty wife, Mary Coral's husband, Mike Marr, was a faculty member. Uh, there was a lady from town whose name I don't remember yet. And there were several other people who were staff members um, that were in the house. When there was a, a group, when the group went to negotiate with Cinex, um, there were women from the house who went out down the staircase and, <laughs> and they were joined by women who were not in the house so that 
Cinex wouldn't know who was in the house and who wasn't. Um, and those women were gone a while. It was night. I have no idea what time any of this took place. It was after dark. Um, so they came back in the house, and Elizabeth Banks came with them. And they Thank said, you, it's, it's the same thing. They, they say things like, oh, well, we've never heard of anybody being unhappy with the health care before. It's like, yes, you have. People have been, people in this house have been there. Uh, and when you when they were telling you that um, and so they, they they were pretty discouraged Elizabeth Banks however mentioned that they were really anxious to get us out of the house before dawn before light because they didn't want newspapers and television show, shows taking pictures of us coming out uh, so that was the handle we had and we said, if you want us out by daylight, this has to be done. And what they could do, in fact, was to get us on agendas. They got the daycare people on the student senate agenda. They got people on search committees for um, the vice chancellorship. They got people, this, this happened, they could do things in the middle of the night. Uh, and Joe wants me to tell this, my favorite story about the negotiating team. The reason why I was on the second team was because I, I said, you be sure and tell them that it's not just students, that there are uh, staff members and faculty wives who will be here in four years and will remember what you do this night. You can't just wait until they graduate and pretend it never happened. So when I got there and we were introducing ourselves, using only first names, <laughs> to Cinex, I, I said this about, I'm here because I want you to know that it's not just students. Um, it's staff and faculty wives. And there was a hush that <laughs> fell over that room. Every man, and of course they were all men, you could see them wondering if they knew where their wives were. <laughs> it was palpable. It was, it was just, it was like, really? <laughs> um, and so, and, and that, that was part of the darkening. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, so when, when, when we said that to them in that way, that if you want us out by this time, this much needs to be done. We need to see this actually working. Um, that's when they decided that they could, in fact, uh, get us on these committees and whatnot. Uh, and then they sent us out of the room while they voted on it or whatever they did. I don't know. Um, and they had, w when we came in, they said, well, you know, the Group W people, Stockstead, I think, was this Professor is Stockstead was. Association of University. Yeah, this is it. AAUP had a group, a group uh, committee W, and they had the women faculty had done a lot of research on uh, salary inequities between male and female faculty members. Uh, and they said those people are mad because you put in this thing on scholarships, and they've just done this work, and they were, and the and the guy who was uh, had East Asian studies is just worried sick. He's just out there dying of, because it was his building. Because it was his yeah, building. Yeah, they were uh, so when when they sent us out while they did whatever they did, I went up and apologized, duh, and said, "I'm sorry, we didn't know that you were upset about this, and and we're you know," uh, and Stockstead said, "We're not upset. <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what they told you, but we're not upset." Um, and the East Asian guy was okay. I mean, it was in the middle of the night, and his building was, so, but he was okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, and and that's how we got the demands met so quickly. What can I ask? What was the one demand you didn't get? Uh, well, they one of them was the pay equity was was stated in terms of civil service because that was what was going on at the university at the time, and they just did away with civil service in, in a year or two. Uh, it did take us several years to get a woman in, in the Vance 
vice chancellorship. Uh, it wasn't the one that was open there, but it was Francis Horowitz, so we did a good job. Once we got there, and we did get. And Marilyn Stockstead was a became an associate dean in the college, so yes. it was a very. It was a small step, but you know some of that was gradual. But by that fall, Hilltop Child Development Center was opening in that same place where you'd met to discuss the issues yes. with Robin Morgan. <laughs> uh, the the issue at uh, Watkins Health Center was a little more challenging because they gradually started to get better, but there was still a lot of misogyny going on there and attitudes that if especially if young married unmarried woman would uh, ask for birth control they would be disparaged it took a while for the healthcare piece to come come around uh, I, d I don't mind mentioning the name it was Schwegler yeah. that's exactly who it was and it it was two years before that he left and things didn't really get better until he was gone um, I'm kind of cognizant of the time. We're having such a wonderful discussion, and I'm so glad that we have Robin Morgan here, too. Um, I know some folks in the audience might have some questions, but before we do that, uh, and maybe all of you can speak to um, uh, what have we learned from all of this, and what can we carry forward uh, when we, we talk about this not being history, but about being... Uh, what happens now? So just thinking, reflecting back on what the February sisters have done, uh, what, what can we learn for today? And I'll ask Robin Morgan to uh, uh, finish up this question too. So, Beth? Well, I would just say that this was a time when um, students were recognizing that they needed to be heard, that students were not um, silent members of the university that students uh, had, uh, were not simply there to receive knowledge, but they were to uh, participate in the, in the whole learning process. And it was, in that sense, it was a revolutionary time in that learning, I think, became a two-way process between student and teacher. And I think this was a, um, what happened on this particular night at the East Asian Studies building in which students actually took over an academic building was revolutionary. I don't know, um, students were very proactive at Cornell, uh, but I don't think anywhere else uh, on a university campus in the country were students as effectively active, as active as they were at KU. And all women. Yeah, and it was all women. And it was all women. Um, I learned that if you really work at it and you get enough people involved, you can do anything. Well said. <laughs> when Molly called me in the middle of the night and started telling me what she envisioned, um, that's when I started to realize changing things does not have to be impossible. It doesn't even have to be hard. It just takes dedication. And then the next day, when I had like way more babysitters than probably would be needed for 20 children in 10 days, I mean, it fell together so easily. And I've used that lesson over and over and over, and it's still true. It's easier than you think to make the changes you want to make. I'm sitting here thinking about the changes. For instance, our um, plea to have a, a free child care center later changed. Faculty were rejecting um, job offers to KU because we didn't have a good child center. And um, I talked to one father who was looking at Hilltop, and at the time we really wanted just free child care for students. But in this case, it was a faculty member who wanted a good child care center for his own kids. Um, <clears throat> the change was incredible. At the mere suggestion, we weren't 
opposed to change. We were opposed to progress. And I think that we did a great job in providing the yearning to have some of these things. Somebody asked what was the uh, demand that we didn't get, and that's, mute. well, it's in different verbal forms, but it basically it's free, um, equal pay for equal work. And I worked on a study with flight attendants to see what their pay was compared to the male um, attendants or um, attendants, and that was not fair at all. And I think if you take a look at any kind of um, um, perspective, we also looked at the number of books somebody published, the kind of ratings they got, which we felt were. Well, I felt was unfair because if somebody was popular and made jokes, they got higher ratings than good academic uh, faculty sometimes. We, I mean, we looked at several cases, but um, anyway, does anybody want Yeah, the, the issue of pay equity is still very much with us. I, before I have Robin speak, I'd like to give a shout out if there's any KU students here because in fact, uh, the funding for Hilltop came from student fees. I mean, if you think this was all top down from the administration, it wasn't. The KU students stepped up time and again to provide uh, their funding for things like Hilltop, the Recreation Center and other things. So they played a big, big role in that as well. So Robin, what are your, what are your thoughts? You, um, and I also, before we uh, have you speak, I wanted to mention that I got an email this week um, from, let me get this right here, um, Diane Showlander, who commented that in April 1973, you came to the University of Pennsylvania to speak, and they had a sit-in, they didn't take over a building, but they were asking for a women's center and a women's studies, and the same thing happened. So you seem to be spreading your, uh, your <laughs> activism, uh, and maybe Vern Miller was right, you know, you were taking it everywhere, so anyway. Um, <laughs> What, uh, tell my us, room. <laughs> so what are you reflecting on, particularly on the February sisters and their, uh, their actions well, and their results? Yeah, yeah, Pennsylvania, and you're quite right, a number, of, a number of other schools began to pick up on this. I mean, word got out. Um, and, uh, and I was amazed by it, you know, elevated in every literal way on my room and emotionally and, and politically and you name it. Uh, but also faintly intimidated by it because my god were they expecting me to carry this revolutionary torch everywhere and light canvases all over the oh my god my god oh, i'm only one woman and i'm only five feet one so uh you know what am i going to do um but the thing the thing i kept coming back to was the ease well one of you said that um uh, you know, that it wasn't that hard, you said. 20 children for how many weeks? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, the, the, I've tried to do a number of things since. Let me put it this way. Um, it's been a life committed to this issue, this cause, uh, internationally as well as nationally. So during the period, when, and now I'm 81, believe it or not, um, I don't know how that happened because last week I was 38, but then I woke up one morning and I was 81. Uh, so that's okay because yes, still active and still the revolution isn't finished. I don't see why we should be. Uh, but I, when I was teaching for a semester, I was guest chair, feminist chair at the uh, University of Denver, for example. I've spoken at a number of universities, not just speaking, but being a writer in residence for a month or uh, teaching for a semester, etc., which of course gives you a totally different perspective. Well, in those three months, I decided rather um, hubristically uh, that I was going to organize the campus. And I did. But my God, was it ever challenging. I wanted to have representatives. I wanted to have a group that would meet once a month and continue its demands and continue upping the ante 
and it had to be comprised of student women, undergrad women, graduate women, faculty women, faculty wives, staff women, and the women who cleaned the toilets at the university and cleaned the dorm rooms and swept the walks, etc. So those were the groups. Oh, excuse me, one more. Uh, and the, the few token women who were in administration. Uh, there was one who was a, an assistant or deputy provost, was about as high as we've gotten at that point. Now, getting these all together on the analogy that individually the can, fingers can be broken, but if they get together, there's one fist, um, that was a great idea, I must say. And it worked. And to my astonishment, it worked. Well, it's still working. And it's been 25 years that it has held. And they have changed their demands uh, as, they, as was necessary. They've broadened them. They've uh, widened them, they've you know given them more depth, they've added courses, they've added demands. Uh, nobody has done this, maybe nobody's had to, but in any event, no one has done this with the drama and the panache of the February sisters. No one has kept, no one has thought through every detail with such exquisite obsessive compulsiveness. Uh, God love obsessive compulsives <laughs> and women who are basically having a homemaker sensibility that says, well, I think I'll make a list and I'll be very sure this is on it, this is on it, because that's how things get done. And the, the idea that after 50 years there are still people who don't know who was in the February sisters or not because security has been maintained is astonishing. The left never could get away with that. The weather people and the underground and the right. And they, uh, they all blab, 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 blabbed all over the place. So that there is a kind of humble, focused, practical, grounded, uh, pragmatic way of going about this that involved everything from children to food to laughter to, at one point I remember somebody telling me, now maybe this was apocryphal, um, maybe it became part of the legend as it went on, but somebody told me that they had uh, put Vaseline, they had brought Vaseline for their faces if there was tear gas. We knew that much yeah. at that point. Is that right? But they'd also discovered another use for Vaseline, which was to slick the halls so that if the police came in through the regular routes, they would slip and slide all over the place. Not like the They're just laughing. I'm not getting it. Confirmation. Just laughing. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. I mean, but you can see, it's the recognition of the wit. We don't want to go for violence. We don't want to go for guns. We don't want to go for any of that. We just want people to slip and slide and bubble along on their bottoms so that they can't arrest us. If there was a good naturedness about it, uh, together with that wit, and I, I just think that was brilliant. So it's no wonder that it got began to get imitated, um, and 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 still is being imitated, and still is being celebrated. For me, it was a, it is, it still is a justification of absolutely everything we try to do for ourselves and each other, um, and a and a banner, an abs, a, you know, a, a an incarnate realization that if we do it together, nothing can stop us. It's when we begin to fraction in between, it's when we begin to let this politics or that politics or, you know, uh, all those, all the, all the jargon and the rhetoric and the, uh, at one point it was leftist male rhetoric, at another point God knows it's been right-wing male rhetoric. Um, but it is definitely male rhetoric. You can tell always because it's always filled with protuberances and yeah. insertions and um, uh, hardening positions, which I find amusing. Uh, but then, you see, I've never known a, fem a feminist who didn't have a hell of a sense of humor. <laughs> uh, and I think the February systems sisters were absolutely brilliant on that. So I just, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything you do and everything you are and that you've kept doing it. Oh, my dear sisters, you can't know what that means. Right now, today, 
because of Ukraine, women, and it is 98% the refugee population are women and kids, are being spit out all across Europe. And a large proportion of them, I just got off an interview this afternoon uh, with the people who, who are fighting trafficking because the traffickers are descending on them uh, in droves. And literally in Germany, they're advertising, we have safe legal brothels for you to do, quote, sex work in, come and be safe. Uh, so the issues you see keep unfolding again and again and again. But as long as there are you uh, and your daughters and your granddaughters and your nieces and your nephews too, there's, there's an answer. Um, and it's a compassionate, good-natured, uh, humanistic, loving answer. Thank you so much, Robin. And I think let's give a hand to you. And I think uh, we need to, we're really giving a hand to the February sisters. Uh, I mean, some of us got, came together and, and knew we wanted to have some way to recognize this after 50 years. And uh, so we need to thank each of you, uh, all the sisters that are here tonight or, or, or uh, have passed on. But I think you can see the, the impact on the university on all of our lives and all of our ability to move forward from here. Uh, we have maybe, uh, Nick, do you think we could do about 10 minutes of questions? Uh, let me reach in front of you. Uh, we, because we're recording this, uh, if you have a question, I want to use the microphone. So let me see if I can get this going. Okay. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. So are there any questions? And I'll just come to you. Uh, so I was really struck um, by the fact that the negotiations were with Senex, and then apparently they had the power to uh, bring about those changes. And um, 50 years later, the, to me, the, the seat of power at the university has moved completely. I mean, I don't think that, that Senex has <laughs> any power. It is the administration, which is like 50 times bigger than it was when <laughs> yeah. uh, the February sisters were here. Um, they're the ones who hold all the power. So if you want to comment on that. I think it's certainly the case that, uh, and I, I did a, a study of, of uh, beginnings of Synex and, and uh, Student Senate and all of that, and, and those were heady times with true uh, representative and collaborative uh, uh, involvement I, I perceived uh, among faculty, staff, and students, and it's it's clearly has changed. And I mean, the chancellor was involved with that. Uh, with yeah, that, was, so it wasn't was at the meeting. separate from that. But the assumption, and also when you think back to 1970, uh, the union burning, uh, the the day at the at the today we gathered at, or some people gathered at the Memorial Stadium to welcome the basketball team. But in the spring of 1970, we were gathered there to decide whether the university was going to shut down or not. And there was a vote among the people there of all the students, staff, and whatever. So the times are very different. But what are your thoughts about 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 how things have changed with Senate? Push it up. Push it up. Yeah. That will, um, I didn't. Ha I I left the university soon after that and have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you were here longer. <laughs> I, um, I would only respond uh, by saying that I think that um, a lot more faculty would have been involved now than were involved in this um, in 1970. And I think that the faculty might have been um, very sympathetic toward the students. I don't know. There might be faculty in the audience who would like to respond here, to that. Do you have a thought on it? Um, I didn't change anything, so. Oh, it's still on. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I have been at the university for. 52 years before I just retired in January. And I think 
Beth was right by saying that the faculty, a lot of them have been through similar issues. And I think they'd be a lot more sympathetic to issues that we, all of us, might think about. I mean, the equal pay for equal work is by far one of my most important ones. But other ones like housing for everybody, um, housing and um, poverty and um, unequal um, rules for um, races. Um, there are many more issues that need addressing and taken care of and vo vocalized by students, faculty, staff. Um, I worked at the libraries for 50, 50 years. And um, <clears throat> there's still issues. If somebody says, well, what do we need to work on? Just look around. Join, join the housing uh, committee for the homeless. Um, there are many things that can be done and I hope they do before I leave this world. <laughs> I've had a, may I, may I Catherine? Yeah. Uh, I've had yes, a ahead. question yeah. coming in Yes, chat. Robin. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm coming in on chat. There you are. Uh, this is someone who has asked, what, uh, well, there's two, two different questions. Yeah. One, is, one is, it, what is it advice, our advice to current students, and the other, uh, is from Carrock Heights, who had the privilege of interviewing Christine Smith, Jolene Anderson, and Catherine Tuttle a few months ago for a podcast segment about the uh, February Sisters. Um, and she wanted to be here tonight, but she has childcare issues. Some things have not uh, things have not changed in fifty years. And she wanted to know how I see my feminist activism entwined with other kinds of activism: peace, racial justice, poverty issues. Etc. It seems to me, she writes, that you all were practicing what we call intersectionality before the term was coined. Now, my answer to her is yes, exactly. Um, and Kim Crenshaw, who is the actual inventor of the phrase intersectionality and doesn't get sufficient credit for it, um, is the first to acknowledge that. We didn't call it by that name. And because we didn't call it by that name, we didn't get credit for it. We didn't know that men are very good at giving each other medals and they have parades and they march around and they wear costumes. It's just fantastic what they do. Women honoring each other, not so much. A little quiet, a little sort of, I'll give her a luncheon. Uh, I'll make a nice brunch. Uh, so we have to learn to really honor and um, uh, it's not a matter of glamorizing, but it's a matter of celebrating each other. Uh, in the case of intersectionality, um, damn right, we were there before the term was coined. In the case of advice to current students, you know, I was thinking about that, and I, I have an answer. Um, it's, it's audacity. It is audacity, because that's, and that's what you were about. That's what February Sisters was about. It is daring to try something, not not anything, and not just wildly, to think something through and to think that is so needed, that is really, how can we not have that? How, what is, ah, and then say, well, I'm gonna do something about it. In my own funny way, my fuddy-duddy little, maybe I can only do this and that, maybe I can only do that and this, but I'm gonna do something about it. And you don't know what you are capable of doing until you're doing it. And then you discover you are capable of a hell of a lot. And the audacity with which this exercise was done, the audacity with which because people could lose jobs and people could lose reputations and, um, and the which with which their security was kept and is still kept, the audacity with which they decided I can't really imagine the fights with the husband at home and the guys saying, you're going to take our kid to what? Um, the you know, I mean, those little details, the three o'clock in the morning kitchen table arguments that go into the making of this kind of thing are uniquely something that women bring to the table and always will. 
And these days, to students, when so much divides us as a country, as a world, and on campuses as well, I wish we could lay down the posturing for a bit. I wish that we could, as was suggested in fact tonight, make a one body or more of a one body together with our faculty, with the women who work at the university, the staff women and the women who clean the dorms, uh, with the women and even in administration, although they may seem elitist and powerful and the enemy, they're not, they're getting mashed just like everybody else. So if you make a little bit of room just to see the humanity in somebody else, remarkable things can happen. And it is sisterhood. And it is something uniquely available at this point in history to women. I hope that it will become available more to men as time goes on. But it is specifically almost permitted for women. Um, some people dismiss it as sentimentality. Some people dismiss it as um, irrelevant. But it is very, very basic and very important. So I would say that combination of audacity and care, care, just a simple little kindness and empathy, moment of ventriloquating yourself into the other person's situation, and a little less attention paid to the, how, um, these are my pronouns, or I am more politically correct than you, or you're not a real feminist unless you this or that, or you're not a real, who cares? I think feminist is a wonderful word. I love it and I'm proud to wear it. But, you know, if you want to call feminist squirrels, I'll say I'm a squirrel, I'm a fin and I'm a squirrel. Because I'm more interested in what we're doing for and with each other. And I really, truly believe that this movement is the politics of the 21st century. You begin to see it operating in international affairs, uh, in politics, in lots of different ways. And I, I think we need to carry ourselves as people who will, in fact, save the bloody world. Because I think we will. So if we have that in mind, ain't nothing can stop us. Thank you. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Does anybody else have a question? Okay. Hi. Um, I guess I'm the only male voice. <coughs> but I do have a question, which I think uh, I'll direct at the members of the panel themselves who were in the February system. I <laughs> the house on February 2nd. Did you pull it a little closer? Okay. Oh, there you go now. You'll be sorry I did that. Um, we've heard a great deal about uh, how the administration was dominated at the time in Strong Hall by men. And indeed it was. Yet there was one woman who was an administrator who may have affected the lives particularly of undergraduate unmarried women more than anyone else. So I'd like to ask the panel uh, to take yourselves back to February 2nd, 1972, and without the value of hindsight, uh, how did the policies of Emily Taylor, the Dean of Women, uh, contribute either to your grievances or to their revolution, uh, resolution. Uh, that's an interesting question because there was a time in my life when Emily Taylor was part of them. Um, I believe that, that Emily Taylor and a lot of women from her generation um, were very dedicated to women, women doing well, um, and um, I think they gave up families and marriage for that. I think they they just spent all of their time working because they wanted women to be seen as as 
serious and real and real workers. Um, and and DNIM did all of that. But DNIM was also part of an administration which was patriarchal and um, do we still have a dean of women? No. Thank God. Um, and, and so I, I, yes, I think what some of the acts that she did contributed to our frustration with the administration. But as a human being, I think she was really doing her best. She was trying really hard. Um, I do not have specifics about um, the, the policies. CJ, who was mentioned earlier, does have a laminated copy of a letter that Emily Taylor sent to her parents saying that she was probably not a good candidate to be a student because she let her roommate into the dorm through a window after hours. <laughs> So, so, yes, that contributed to our <laughs> frustration with the administration. Um, but I'm not going to say anything really bad about Dean M. She was doing the best she could. On uh, Tuesday night next week, we'll have a panel looking at these different demands, and a woman who's wrote, written a book about Dean M. Taylor will be there. And it, it, it is complex, and I agree. I think she, she did a lot of important and good things, and also it was a challenging time, and she was... Uh, a part of that uh, rule piece of, of being a dean of women. So we can talk about that maybe next Tuesday night. Uh, Kelly Satorius will be there. Uh, did you say you had one question? And then we'll have to finish. Mm -hmm. I have one question too. Uh, I, was, I was around in those times at KU and I have a recollection of an event it occurred over in the old Polk Auditorium, which is no longer standing. Um, and this might have occurred prior to the exact time of a frigid February night, but there was an organization of women's students. At the time that I'm describing, there was a policy that female students that were living in official housing at KU and sororities they had a curfew on weeknights until like 10 o'clock. They also signed in and they signed, signed out and they signed in whenever they left the building. Well, this group of women, somehow a governing, somehow a governing body, gathered together at Hoke Hall to decide what they wanted to do about that. And they ended up deciding they wanted to keep that policy in place. Wow. This left me perplexed, but realizing that not everybody is always ready to jump on the same page. Mm -hmm. And I found it enlightening. And I thank you, Christine, for my new word in darkening. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very complex time. And, and I and Kathy Rose Mockery you know, have some, a lot of details on this, which I'd be glad to talk to you about. But there was something called the Associated Women Students. And it was a very intriguing concept of self-governance. But somehow, because these women were so much a part of the culture, the governance they envisioned for themselves was not like the February sisters. And so they did go through this period of time when they were allowing them to vote, on whether they would end it. Uh, finally, we did have a, a senior key policy, which had like 10 pages that you had to go through to just sign out a key. Uh, but I think in this one, Emily Taylor actually was kind of pushing them uh, to, to, to change. And I have seen boxes and boxes of letters in the chancellor's papers uh, of parents writing in uh, to bring curses on the university because we were ending hours for senior women and then for juniors and so on. So you're right, it was a very complex time and, and people were trying to work through that. Okay, one last question over here. Hello, uh, my name is Diane Showlander and I represent uh, the University of Pennsylvania even though my father was taught physical education by James Naismith. <laughs> anyway, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, when we sat in in 1973, uh, I think it's a little, I, I was moved to tears by each of you. So I'm very close <laughs> to what you're saying. Um, it wasn't just your actions were picked up by other schools, like it was a wave 
we were all suffering our individual, uh, you know, well, you know, <laughs> not every day maybe, but um, boys going to war and all these things that are happening. There were rapes on our campus and we had to make, we wanted women's studies programs and we did have a sit-in. I don't know that we took over a whole building, but we were there for a while. Uh, I myself didn't go to the sit-in. I'd been at a few sit-ins taking over other buildings for anti-war reasons. But um, what I just wanted to say is I wanted to acknowledge that we didn't sit there and say, oh yeah, February sisters. You know, I think it was all of us who were part of that same cloth where we saw the housing problem was the unemployment problem was the you know this intersectionality um, and uh, I'm just so glad to be a part of the group and I just wanted to assert that uh, the importance of what you did but also not to den not, it's not den you weren't denigrating by saying that everybody picked up on what you did I think it was more a groundswell, and I just want to acknowledge that groundswell. Well, I do. I would love to say a thank you to um, I just want to say that I'm feeling the groundswell of thank you to Mike Hill for all the inspiration you gave other groups and Christine I know you have been such a leader in social justice and war you know the, the fight against war and Joe it was wonderful to hear you say your involvement with tenants to homeowners a fantastic organization um, and I'm very involved with housing and credit counseling Inc and so again affordable housing issues that are impacting families across the state and nation, but they all stemmed out of your activism. You may remember that um, Kansans for Improvement of Nursing Homes. Oh, yes. You know, when we got that started with Petey. Uh -huh. All of that stemmed from your brave work. So thank you. Thank you. Sure. So another round. amazing evening I would like us to thank again Robin Morgan for being such a wonderful part of our evening and thank you for inspiring us again my day my year my <laughs> my everything and I hope that you will invite me back for the hundreds <laughs> we'll, we'll be here we'll be here Thank you, Beth, to Christine, to Joe, and to Shanette, and thank you all. Now, we have wonderful refreshments. I'm sorry you can't join us, Robin, for those, but please stop and have some refreshments. We're celebrating this 50th anniversary, so there's wine, there's hors d'oeuvres. Help yourselves, and thank you for being here. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Catherine.